Hey, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Let's go check out our next story. Hi, I'm Robin McGraw, and you're watching Behind the Brand. Hey, uh, I usually ask my guests, how'd you get this job? A lot of people don't know my husband if I just said, I'm married to Dr. McGraw. They're like, okay. But I think a lot of your viewers and your uh, many fans would know him better if I said, I'm married to Dr. Phil. Honestly, he's a wonderful man. We've had a, up to this point, beautiful marriage. We've known each other now over 43 years, but we did move here from Texas, a state we love, we love Texas. I had to drag my feet a little bit to get here, but we love California. And what brought us here, of course, is the Dr. Phil show. And uh, we just started a month ago filming the 15th season of the Dr. Phil show. Yeah, it's amazing. You're a part of every single show. Um, you shoot a couple of shows a day, right? That's right. Uh, so tell us that story. We were talking a little bit off camera how that came to be, but you're, you're there, you're in the audience, and then you kind of close every show with them, don't you? It, it really, yes, yes, you're absolutely right, but it all started by accident. I had no intention of, of going to every taping. I had really no intention when, once that started of ever being in front of the camera. I was uh, only at that first show, of course, to support Philip. This was a new life we started once we moved out here. Him having his own talk show, of course, he'd been on Oprah for five years, Tuesdays with Dr. Phil. Uh, but no, I didn't go to Chicago every time he taped that show. But uh, we wanted to support Jay, Philip, myself. We wanted to support Philip with this new venture. Uh, I've always thought Philip was very brilliant. I've always thought he had so much to share with the world and well you know what they say you know you marry your equal oh i love that yeah so i mean the impression i get because we sat down with dr phil and he was really gracious and um also very humble and spoke very highly of you but you can kind of tell you can get the impression that you're very much the wing beneath his wings you know that um i think he does so well because he has such a great support system that's really true i do support him and he supports me we're each other's biggest fan and I was there that first day to support him doing this, this that I think he was meant to do. I believe the Dr. Phil show was something he was meant to do. And, and so I was there for both shows. First show ends, they did not tell him what to do after he did his thing. And he looked out at me and I was just, I had tears in my eyes. I was so proud of him. And he just walks over to me and we walk off and he said, what'd you think? At that point, we thought the cameras had stopped when he was on stage. And I stayed for the second show and the next day. Yeah, and the producer's going, keep it going, keep it going, this is gold. Yes, yeah. I have to tell you, he's had the same, pretty much the same staff since day one. Um, the same cameraman and the same executive producer. She's brilliant, Carla Pennington, love her. Executive producer from day one, my best friend from day two. And she came out after about three days of taping and said, Robin, is there any way you could come to every taping because when I see the two of you walk off like that, he's a different man. Yeah. The viewer will see, get to see a different side of Dr. Phil yeah. because there's something about the two of you when you're together and you're talking about that show and he looks at you. I want the viewer to see that. He yeah. becomes who he really is off camera. Well, it's yin and yang, right? Like you probably compliment uh, where he's weak and vice versa. Thank you. I, and so, yes, I said, if that's what you want, if that's what you need, if that's going to help this show, I'm there. And I worked around carpool and I said, well, if you can, I can get Jordan to school and get him picked up, then, then yes, I can be here. And that's how it started. I'm at every show. I've never missed one. And uh, I have to tell you something funny. When I'm there at that show and in my chair, I still sit there on the edge of my seat, listening to every word he says, as if it's the first time I've ever heard him say it. I really believe he is brilliant, and I love to hear him interact with those guests. Is there any time that maybe he's uh, not said what you think he should have said, and you tell him so? Yes. Okay, can you think of any specific examples? I you should have told her off, or you should have been more gentle with him, or... I, I, sometimes I'll say, and I really cannot think of an example of a show, of, of a guest, 
But it happens. But it happens. And we'll be talking about it at night over dinner. And I'll say, oh, Philip, you missed a good chance to say this, or I wish you had, did you notice this? Or, and it's, it's rare, it's seldom. But even when I give him what I wish maybe he had said, the show is still wonderful. Everything he says is, is perfect, but he wants to know that. His entire control room is pretty much women. Yeah. And, or sometimes I'll say, oh, I wish you hadn't said that because I don't believe that she's needed to hear that or something like that. He'll go, oh, well, I'm going to take that out. I think you're right. But it's seldom that that happens. But he loves to hear my opinion and all the women on his staff. Yeah. Are you pretty open to his suggestions? Do um, you ever get Dr. Field? Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to be honest with you today. Uh, ask me whatever you want. But um, I, I will say I put down a rule. Before he was the Dr. Phil, we all know. He was Dr. Phil in, in our home. And I gave him the rule that you can never Dr. Phil me. If I need Dr. Phil, I will ask for it. So he, we live by that rule in our home. Yeah, so there's a clean separation of church and state, yeah? Huge separation. Yeah. Are you pretty receptive, though, when he tells you? I mean, does he give you kind of that, how's that working for you speech sometimes? Like I said, he's a smart man yeah. and he listened that first time I said don't ever doctor fill me unless I ask for it now if I ask for it you can do it so sometimes I'll say hunt I need your advice on something um, I need you to sum this up for me or help me through this then he knows he can do whatever and say whatever he needs but I don't ever ask him about myself it's always for a friend this episode is all about you, and so I have so many questions. You know, the people who watch this show, they're entrepreneurs. They're, they're in the struggle, and, you know, they're in the trenches battling it out, um, either mentally or physically trying to get their, their thing off the ground, or they're hustling, or they've got a side gig, or maybe even they're working for the man, and they're plotting their escape at some point. They've got this great idea. Um, we talked off camera about how you basically dedicated the first part of your entire life to being a mother, and that was what you're most passionate about. And I think it's worth underscoring that there's probably no better or more important job than being a parent. I and, agree. Yes, I believe that. And so I want you to talk about kind of the transition from then to now, because you know, being a businesswoman, being a professional, launching a product like you're doing, um, everything that you're involved with is probably very different from your former life. Yes. You talk to us a little bit about that. Okay. I knew he was the one. And my entire life. How did you know, by the way? Was it something you felt? It was something I felt. But honestly, there were a few questions that I was very serious about that I asked. On the third date, he'll again say that was the first date. But um, honestly, it was being with him. But I watched how he treated his mother. He was such a little puppy i don't know it was so sweet how he treated his mother respectful so respectful so kind-hearted and he would say things about his mother and not even realize that he was doing it like one day when i'm finished with school and i can afford it i'm gonna buy my mother this or i'm gonna do this for my mother and he would always look for his mother when he came into the house yeah. because when he moved back to town to go back to school there, he stayed with his mother. He lived with his mom and dad. And I met him through his sister. And so, I don't know, that had a lot to do with it. That's some foreshadowing of the, mm -hmm. of the future, yeah. And he was just so kind to me and, and just, I just loved him right away. I just, Were you going to school at the time? Um, I had just graduated high school. That's how young I was. And we went away to Denton, Texas, to North Texas. And what did you want to be at the time? At the time, I had to work full time. We, I grew up very poor and I couldn't, I, I, there was no such thing as taking out loans or anything like that. So I worked full time and went to school at night. And um, I wanted to be, I majored in elementary education. But, but my life goal, I knew from the time I was very young that I wanted to be a wife and mother. And so then how did you make that transition? You know, your kids got older, they, they grew up and they're amazing, they're doing their own things. Um, uh, you know, again, I think a lot of people, um, no matter what your age, we're constantly trying to reinvent ourselves, right? And talk about that process. Was that easy? You know, what do you have to learn? 
Break it down for us. Uh, once we moved out to California from Texas, again, I said it was a huge life change and it was, but I'm one of those that love change and I'm one of those that believe. I believe that the Lord has a plan for everyone and I have always believed we're supposed to be here. This is part of our plan. This is part of where our life has now taken us. And opportunity presented itself for me to start my foundation. Well, you had a platform, right? Yes. I mean, when I'm afforded a platform like the number one daytime talk show, I'm not just going to sit there and do nothing. Yeah. So I had the ability to reach out to millions, millions. And I thought, well, what do I want to do with it? And I will tell you, because I've sat through every show, the ones that have moved me the very most are the ones we've done on domestic violence and sexual assault. And so I created my foundation when Georgia smiled, the Robin McGraw Revelation Foundation. And when, when Georgia smiled, it was named in honor of my mother. Her name was Georgia. And a lot of people ask me if she's a victim of domestic violence. She was not, nor have I ever been. But it is those women that come on the show that show such strength. And, and let me say right now, it's not just women, men also. Come on the show and show such strength to want to reach out and ask for help because they're at that point where they're not ashamed. They know that this could be their last chance but they come on that show and they show the strength to tell their story and ask for help, but also those men and women who have been through that same situation, who when they see on our site that we're asking for anyone who wants help so we can do that show, they will write in and call in and say, I wanna be a part of your team in helping these victims because I've been there. Those shows have moved me so much that I created the foundation and focused on, on those people and I created some products so that 100% of the net proceeds would then go to the foundation. I created uh, a lip gloss line. I named it Avery Lasting Love after our granddaughter Avery. The first two colors in the lip gloss line are named the Erica and the Elizabeth, our daughter-in-law's first and middle name, and the other two are Georgia May. I created a candle collection called The Light of My Life and the four candles in the collection are named the Philip, the J, the Jordan, and the London, my grandson. So, of course, it's all about family and love. Everything comes from the heart, and 100% of the net proceeds of those candles go to the foundation. So that was my first mission. And from that, I created my lifestyle brand, the Robin McGraw Revelation. Uh, now, can I ask, you know, some, what are some of the business lessons that you've learned along the way? I think, you know, what is that Gandhi quote, right? You know, be the change you want to see in the world is spot on. It's so perfect. Uh, and, you know, you're living that. Uh, but what did you learn along the way, you know, maybe skills wise? Because what I think gets a lot of people stuck is they don't feel like they're ready or prepared. You know, whether you're in college right now and you're like, oh, as soon as I graduate, then I'm going to start my big idea. Or you're like, well, as soon as I get enough experience, you know what I mean? It's like, there always seems to be something else you need to prepare, be prepared for or get a license or for someone to give you permission. But like, what are some of these skills that you need to learn to get you to where you are right now? You know, you've said a lot right there in the question. Uh, you have to, I believe, you have to use the skills that you have. That makes a big part of it. That makes it a lot easier. Like, I'm not gonna deny, I have the, biggest platform ever to use to get my message out there. I'm People not are going to ignore that. So of course, use every skill you have. Use every contact that you have. Um, so those are resources, but what do you... You have to use your passion. You have to know your passion and, and, and never forget that. Never forget that you have this desire this focus, this passion for what it is you want to do and never give that up, never. Make a plan. Everything starts with a plan. Everything starts with a goal and never turn away from that. It doesn't matter how many obstacles are in your way, never turn away from that plan. Never turn away from that goal because if it comes from your heart, 
it's going to happen. That's what I believe. And, and everything I'm doing now in, in Robin McGraw Revelation, everything I'm doing now really started from when I was a young child, knowing what I wanted when I became an adult, knowing what I would and would not accept in this world. And everything I am creating now has been inspired from what either what I've gone through, what I knew I wanted. It's I launched the first product in Robin McGraw Revelation lifestyle brand, a skincare line. And my whole reason, in fact, the reason I named my company Robin McGraw Revelation comes from my own personal revelation that I had 31 years ago. Which was what? Well, I was on the telephone with my mother and we had just moved into a house that in the middle of the night that we needed to do a lot of work on. And my mother was gonna come over and help me unpack and get settled. And I got a phone call from her and she said, uh, sweetheart, I'll be over in a sec. And I said, great. And she said, but for some reason I'm feeling kind of funny. And when I said, what do you mean by funny? I did not know that when she said, I'm feeling kind of funny, she was dying right then. Those were her last words she would ever speak to me, to anyone, she was dying right then. When I asked her, what do you mean by funny? She was already gone. And I hung up the phone thinking we had been disconnected and it rang again and Philip walked into the room, he picked it up and I heard my father screaming. I heard Philip say, call an ambulance. We raced over there and he walked outside to me where I was in shock and he said, she's gone. And I remember looking at him saying, what? And he goes, she's gone, I'm sorry, she's gone. And I said, she, you've got to be kidding. She's never been sick a day in her life. She's never even been to the doctor. And right then I had my revelation. Right then when I said she's never even been to the doctor, I thought, my revelation was she never put herself first. She never, ever took care of herself. She always put me, my twin brother, my three older sisters, my father, everyone else came first. And I thought, I can't, I can't do it. My revelation was I will not perpetuate her, se her legacy of self-neglect because my entire life I wanted to be just like my mother. I wanted to be the woman, the wife, the mother, the grandmother that she was. She taught me the strength of a woman. And I have always wanted to be just like her. Well, it sounds like she gave you that gift, that revelation as well. She did, she did. I knew right then I needed to take care of myself, not only yeah. on the inside, but the outside, so that I could be here to take care of those I love. Wow. Can we talk about, um, can we talk about getting older? Yes. Can we? I yes, mean, I'm, yeah. I'm not a young pup anymore either, so I'm, I'm fine because um, I would like to learn a little bit here personally um, to, and hear your journey. Um, you know, a lot of us who are working hard and raising families and doing our thing, it's this work-life balance, you know, struggle um, that I can never really seem to get balanced. But um, can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities, you know, successes you had and maybe failures with as you're growing older, trying to stay fit, manage all these things. I mean, you know, you look amazing. Thank you. Um, I want to look amazing too. And, and, and I struggled with this a bit because I'm always on the road or traveling, but can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you've managed um, to kind of get this thing down? As I said earlier, when my mother passed so suddenly, she was only 58 years old when she passed of the undiagnosed heart disease. And my revelation that day was to take care of myself. And I think that's so important because now I'm 62 years old and I was gonna make sure that every day for the rest of my life, I was gonna do whatever I needed to do to truly be the healthiest I could be on the inside as well as the outside. Now, of course, genetics plays a huge part. I inherited my father's metabolism, so thank heavens. But um, it is a priority. Your health is a priority. It has to be, or you're going to be gone just like that. Well, when, so, did you, when, did you, when did you battle with this, you know, whether it was you know, at a certain age or like a certain lifestyle 
phase? I have to say, it's a battle every day of your life. It, but it, ha it has to be a decision that you make. It has to be a decision, a choice that you make that you're gonna find out what your body needs, what you have to do to stay your healthiest. And I will say probably in my early 30s. Now, I had my first child when I was 26 and it was after his birth that I thought, okay, I'm going to have to find out what it is I need to do to get back into shape. But I will say before that, I've always been an athlete. I've always enjoyed staying fit. It's always been important to me. So it was more about fitness in my 30s. Then in my 40s, hormones played a big part. So I did every bit of research. I can tell you, I went to the library, I went to the bookstore, I would sit in the floor, I would read certain books until I knew exactly which ones I had to buy. Um, when I was younger, we didn't have the internet like we have now, but it's research. It's all about research and learning your own body. Right. I, I visit doctors, I ask for referrals, because I wanna know what I need to say my healthiest. It's, it's custom made, like, yes. so, you know, what works for someone else doesn't necessarily work for you. That's exactly right. So that's why everyone needs to learn their own body. And that's what I've done. And I do the blood work. I do every test that I need to do. And there are brilliant, brilliant people out there, scientists, doctors, nutritionists. And I visit them, not all the time. I'm not obsessed with it. But it is kind of funny right now that when I'm out with the girls, we have lunch or something, and someone will say, why aren't you eating your salad? Well, Honestly, I don't eat anything green because I know my body can't handle it. I, I don't eat, there's an enzyme that my body cannot handle from green vegetables and lettuce and stuff. So, and I can handle carbs. So it makes a lot of people mad when I order french fries and they order a salad, but I've learned that. I've done my research and I know what my body can handle. And I think that's what's so important for every single human being. Find out what your body can handle, what your body needs, doesn't need, and take care of yourself.